Um, and with that, I will introduce our speaker, who many of you already know. Um, Dr. Nicole um, is our success story. Um, we adore her. We are lucky to have her. Um, she began as a DCP volunteer, then an intern, then a field assistant, research assistant, teaching assistant, then a PhD student. Um, she has finished her PhD and she is now our postdoc, our postdoctoral associate. And she is uh, based at, well, virtually based at uh, Florida International University. So we're also very happy to have that new collaboration. Um, so today, Nicole is going to talk to us about social network analysis. And then just that last reminder um, that we're recording. And when you find yourself muted, that's on purpose. So please utilize the chat function for your questions. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Nicole. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be back with you all today and talking about social network analysis which we also call SNA for short. Um, it is a fairly complex topic, so I've tried to boil it down to the really simple details um, and how I applied it in my PhD research. So a network is simply a set of nodes that are linked by edges, which signify a relationship between the nodes. So in this really simple example network, these white circles are our nodes and the lines between them are called edges. And in some networks, we're able to uh, draw the edges so that their thickness is also proportional to the strength of whatever relationship we are representing. Network analysis is used to study self-organizing systems. So this includes human systems, but also neural networks, food webs, um, things like that. And in these systems, our nodes represent individual players. So that could be individual humans, individual dolphins, individual neurons or levels of the food chain. And then the edges between them represent the relationship. So that could be anything from friendship or collaboration to kinship, um, a neural connection, or uh, in a food web, for example, where carnivores are eating um, lower levels of the food chain. And network analysis has been used to study social organization in a few animal species, including bottlenose dolphins, guppies, and chimpanzees. And when it's applied to these social systems, we call it social network analysis, or SNA. Our network statistics, which is what we use to summarize our networks, are called network measures. And network measures can describe how well connected the nodes are and how they're connected. And using these network measures, we can identify nodes that play an important role in overall network structure and cohesion. For example, in this simplified network, if we were to look at node number one, we can see that it connects a variety of other pairs of nodes. So number six and three, number five and two, they're all connected through number one. So we would say that number one has high centrality. Looking at number eight, by contrast, we can see that it has lower centrality. It does connect pairs of nodes that might otherwise not be connected, like number 12 and number one, but it has lower centrality than number one. But then we can see that it has a much more important role in the overall network than node number one, because if we were to take out number one, number six and number three would still be connected, just much more indirectly than they were when they could pass through number one. If we took out number eight, the four nodes on the left would no longer be connected to the 10 on the right. So by using these network measures, we can identify the role that individual nodes play. We can also use different relationships to um, define our edges, but using different relationships may change our results. So in terrestrial or captive species, we can usually directly observe our interactions. Whereas in cryptic species, meaning species that either don't come out in the open very often, maybe they're nocturnal, or maybe they live their whole lives underwater, like our marine species like dolphins. Um, so we use what is called the gambit of the group. And in this hypothesis, presence in the same group or association is a proxy for interaction. We're assuming that individuals who are together are going to interact in some way. Now you might notice that there is a little bit of a leap there. So if you're thinking about humans, you could have 100 people in the same office building eight hours a day, five days a week, but that doesn't guarantee that those 
individuals are all going to interact with each other. So even though they're spending such a large amount of time together, we can't always assume that interaction um, is going to happen. So our association and interaction networks may not be directly comparable. But our Bimini Spotted Dolphin Group and our DCP Data Archive provide the opportunity to test this hypothesis for dolphins. So in our field site, we have the opportunity to collect both association and interaction information. We collect our observations from the boat and underwater about who is in a group. And then we record using our mobile video acoustic system um, when the dolphins are interacting. So I use that to my advantage to create our two networks. The first was our association network, which was created using coefficients of association, which if you have watched our previous webinars, you would know that these are an estimate of the proportion of time that individuals are together. So we can only know that dolphins are together if we see one or both dolphins in front of us. That's why it's just an estimate of the proportion of time that they're together. And I used the values from 2013 to 2018. So here is an example of one of our social networks measured with our COAs. And in this network, I'm only showing pairs that have um, a COA that's at least 0.2 or greater. Females are represented with yellow circles and males are blue squares. And they are plotted so that dolphins that have a higher number of associates with stronger connections are more central and are closer to each other. The second network I created was based on interactions. I focused on pectoral fin contacts that were recorded from 2013 to 2018. And I chose these because network studies of primates often use grooming as their linking relationship. So by using pectoral fin contacts, I am able to uh, compare to other species. So as a reminder of what our pectoral fin contacts look like, you'll see these two juvenile females interacting using their pectoral fins. And we reviewed all of the data from 2013 to 2018 and recorded every time we saw dolphins interacting. So I did create some restrictions um, on my association and interaction networks to make sure that I was only looking at the same dolphins. So based on my restrictions, I included 52 dolphins that associated or interacted to some minimum requirement so that I was directly comparing networks about the same dolphins. So there are a few things that we can do um, when we're applying SNA to our dolphin group. The first is to compare those networks to each other. Do they have a similar number of edges or connections between the dolphins? So here we're looking at our association network on top and our interaction same way, where individuals with a similar number of associates or interaction partners are plotted more closely together and more centrally. Females are yellow, males are blue. And you can see just by looking that dolphins are more interconnected in the association network. When we're looking at the exact number of edges, the association network has 794 edges, whereas the interaction network only has 274. And what this really means is that on average, dolphins were observed hanging out with 30 dolphins um, in the time period from 2013 to 2018, whereas they interacted on average with 10 other dolphins. So just by looking at the very general uh, features of these networks, we can already tell that we're gonna get different information from an association network versus an interaction network, even when including the same 52 dolphins. So just because dolphins are hanging out in the same group, they may not always be interacting. Another thing that we can do using SNA is to compare networks to random networks, and we do this to learn um, what kind of network it is that we're looking at. So we can ask questions like, how many edges would there be if 52 dolphins were to associate or interact randomly? Um, and if every single dolphin was connected to every single other, we would have 1,326 connections, whereas we only have 794 for the association network and 274 for the interaction network. So in this image, we're looking at the association and interaction networks that I observed on top, and then the associated random networks created below. The random networks have the same number of nodes and edges as the observed network, but the links between them are distributed randomly instead of what we actually observe. So you can see a random network has a lot more connections between individual nodes 
than the observed, um, or the, the edges are more randomly distributed, making it a more cohesive network overall. By comparing two random networks and other types of networks, we can learn features of our networks. And I found that both networks show attributes of what we call small world networks. And in this type of network, the average distance or the number of nodes that you have to pass through to connect two individuals is going to be similar to the random network, but they're going to have a higher clustering coefficient. So that's what where we see these little clusters of um, more similar dolphins in both networks. Uh, that's one of the features that sets it apart from random. So we see small world networks in a few different places in the natural world. That includes the neural network of the worm species C. elegans, the power grid of the Western United States, and the collaboration um, between film actors. So you may have heard of six degrees of separation. The human global population seems to have an average distance of six, meaning that any two humans can be linked using five intermediate acquaintances on average. These features of small world networks propagate signals such as information. So if you think of humans, we could propagate gossip more quickly, um, but it can also propagate disease, something that requires links between individuals more easily. And we can see that the random network is more homogeneous. The number of links follows a different distribution. Another thing we can do with SNA is to compare network measures of individuals between each network. So we can ask, do dolphins play a similar role in each network? So I used a few different uh, network measures to explore the individual roles in the in association versus the interaction network. The first of these is called degree, which is simply the number of edges that are connected to a node. Um, the degree is a little bit less meaningful than a related measure called strength, which is the sum of the weighted values of the edges. So when we're thinking of, for example, our association network, the strength would be the actual COAs added together, which would give us a better idea of how strong our associations are versus just the number of associates that an individual dolphin has. Unfortunately, because we're using coefficients of association for our association network, and number of interactions for our interaction network, we can't actually compare between the two. So instead, we just stick with degree. So the number of associates or interaction partners that each dolphin had. Another measure that we can use is our betweenness, which is known as the number of shortest paths between pairs of nodes that pass through a single node, which sounds very complicated. So using our simplified network, um, we can think of betweenness as the number of pairs that are indirectly connected by each node. So looking at this purple node, it doesn't link any pairs of individuals. So its betweenness would be zero. Whereas this green node connects this white one to the purple one, it also more indirectly connects all of these white ones to this purple one. And then if we look at the orange node, it indirectly connects many more pairs of nodes plus all of the longer connections that it takes. So the orange node would have the highest betweenness of our three different colored nodes. Individuals with high betweenness may hold a crucial position by connecting pairs that might not otherwise be connected to each other. And then I also looked at clustering coefficient or how well connected an individual's associates or interaction partners are to each other. So a higher clustering coefficient means that there's more redundancy in our a network. So I calculated all of these measures for the individuals in our uh, networks, and then I averaged across the whole network so that we could take a look at the distribution and compare them. So as a reminder, for anyone who hasn't looked at a box plot recently, this middle line is called our median. 50% of our values lie below and above this line. This bottom line is our first quartile. 25% of our values lie below it. And our third quartile, where 75% of our values fall below it. These dots show our outliers. So again, just by looking, we can see that degree was higher in the association network than it was in the interaction network. And this difference was significant. But it is not surprising, given that the association network has nearly three times as many connections between dolphins. It makes sense that each individual in the association network has a higher degree than in the interaction network. But it can already illustrate how different the network me metrics can be 
simply based on the relationship that we're using to define the edges between individuals. So this might influence the conclusions that we're going to draw about the sociability of individuals based on the relationship that we're using. I also found um, that betweenness was higher in the interaction network, actually, though it was correlated between the networks. So dolphins with higher betweenness in the interaction network also tended to have high betweenness in the association network. Higher betweenness in the interaction network is probably due to the lower number of edges. So there are going to be fewer direct connections between dolphins, meaning that there are going to be more indirect links. So more dolphins will be serving as the intermediary between other pairs. And then I found that the clustering coefficient was higher in the association network, but that this difference was not statistically significant. And this high clustering coefficient, as I said before, suggests a redundancy in connections. So it makes it more resilient to the loss of individuals. With more connections overall in the association network, there's likely to be more redundancy, but it does seem that even um, in the interaction network, we might have a similar redundancy. Though you can see that the distribution is much wider in the interaction network than it is in the association network. So another thing that we can do with SNA is experimentally remove individuals and compare the resulting networks. So the reason we might want to do this is if we're investigating a social group that is at risk from um, human impacts, climate change, um, or a disease, we can see what might happen to the social network if we were to remove important individuals or randomly remove individuals, what would happen to the other individuals that are um, left behind. Um, we could also be looking at populations of an endangered species if we wanted to remove an individual to bring them into captivity to try to get um, to have them mate and increase the population, we can specifically target individuals that are going to have a lower impact on the resulting network. So my simulated removal of individuals was removing the 10 individuals that had the highest betweenness from each network. As a reminder, betweenness is the number of shortest paths between pairs of nodes that pass through a single node. So it highlights important individuals. And um, though betweenness correlated between the two networks, the 10 with the highest betweenness were different in the association and the interaction network. And after removing them, I explored changes in the remaining network. For example, in the number of edges that, or the links between nodes and the average degree or the number of edges connected to each node. So as a reminder, this is what our networks looked like before removals, where the association network had 794 edges, the interaction network had 274 edges, and we have these peripheral individuals that are kind of indirectly connected. Um, we have those in both networks. After removing our 10 individuals with highest betweenness, we see that our interaction network especially becomes much more disjointed. So while everyone is still connected to each other, it's going to take a lot more um, to get information, for example, from dolphin number 70 over here to number 69 than it did before. Um, and we see this less so in our association network. So again, our association network starts with more edges. It has more redundant connections. So it's going to be less impacted by the removal of important individuals. So in summary, we can use social network analysis to learn about the overall network structure, the role that individuals play in a network, or what we, uh, we can simulate the loss of nodes or individuals and what would happen to the resulting network. And we realize that social networks provide different results based on the relationship that we use to define the links between individuals. So in our two networks, we saw that most network measures differed significantly between the two. And we had nearly three times as many connections between dolphins when looking at associations versus interactions. So this suggests that caution should be taken when inter interpreting social behavior from association networks. We should also be very careful when comparing networks. A lot of delphinid studies will use association as their measure and then compare to primate studies that use interaction. So when we're uncovering differences between our different species, these differences might not actually be as significant as we think if we are um, instead looking at interactions between dolphins and comparing to interactions between primates, perhaps we would find more similarities. Um, and then we also might draw conclusions about our study for example, 
um, that a population is more resilient to the loss of individuals. But if we're looking at associations, this might be misleading when um, looking at an interaction network, dolphins might play a more important role in keeping the network together. And with that, I will say thank you. And any questions that you might have can be directed to my new email address, nicole at dcpmail.org. And uh, we're gonna go through a couple of final things before we get to your questions. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so a reminder, particularly to anybody who is new to DCP webinars um, or missed the beginning, uh, this is being recorded. So um, you may be watching the recording by now, um, but the all the recordings can be found on our website. Under the education tab, you'll find a webinar option and they're all posted there. And usually the first or second post on this page also includes our upcoming schedule. Um, we're still putting together the schedule for spring 2021. So um, be patient as we as we fill out that schedule. Um, they're also posted to YouTube. Our YouTube, our newer YouTube channel is cleverly named Dolphin Communication Project. I'm so sorry. And then that's me. My um, internet is on a delay, so there we go. Um, if you've enjoyed the webinar, you might also enjoy um, our podcast, The Dolphin Pod. Um, our hosts, Dr. Justin Gray and Laura Teasdale, um, chat about new science, old science. They put a nice comedic uh, spin on it, and that's accessible directly from the DCP website or wherever you get your podcasts. And this program that you just listened to is a deep dive. So you can see it was geared towards an older audience. We do deep dives most second and fourth Thursdays at one o'clock Eastern. And then we also have dolphin lessons, which are geared more towards elementary students, but I think they are fun for all ages. Um, that's a shorter presentation, Q&A, and are generally on the first and third Tuesdays that we won't be starting until the third Tuesday in February. Um, that's also at one o'clock Eastern. And then lastly, um, we wouldn't be a good nonprofit if we didn't remind you how you can support us. Um, so we are thrilled to offer these webinars for free, um, but that is possible because of the support we get through our Adopt a Dolphin program, memberships, donations, products. Um, and of course, when it's safe, uh, you can join us in the field. Um, we have field courses to Honduras and to Bimini, where the dolphins Nicole spoke about today reside. Um, and we actually are hoping that it might be safe enough to do our July 2021 eco tour. So that is July 11th to the 16th that we recommend folks arrive on the 10th. Um, and you can find all sorts of information about that on our website or jot us an email um, or track us down on social media. So with that, um, Nicole, we have some questions. Um, and the first one, I'm gonna ask them out of order, but one I think kind of goes to the history a little bit. Um, when was social network analysis first used? Like what, what was the, it can be used for so many things. How did it start? Um, so network analysis has been used for decades. And I think it was in, um, the 40s was the first application to human networks, and then it has really taken root in animal social networks in the past 20 years, I'd say. There are many, many books that you can find about how to apply social network analysis to animal social networks. And what can you remind people, I apologize if I missed it while I was uh, working the chat, what software did you use for this? Um, so I used a couple of different software programs. One is a package in uh, MATLAB, if anyone's heard of that, and the program is called SOCPROG. So that one is specifically to create the networks and find some of the network metrics. And then another program, uh, and that one was developed by Hal Whitehead, who's at Dalhousie, Dalhousie University yeah. um, in Halifax. And the second program is called Usenet, and it has a few other packages within it that I also used to create the images of the networks. That one was created by Borgatti and is more targeted towards 
human social networks, but has been applied a lot more recently um, to animal social networks. And just to add to that, if anyone's interested in reading about the material, I believe on um, Hal Whitehead's website at Dalhousie University that they have details about SOCPROG, which is um, S-O-C-P-R-O-G. It's, it's the acronym for it. Yes, um, and it is free to download. So if you wanted to download it and play with it, um, you could do that, but the MATLAB software is not free, unfortunately. Yeah. So I think they offer a version that you don't have to run through MATLAB, but it just has less capability. All right, I'm popping some of that in the chat. Some people ask for some information to be typed in. Um, I'm not sure that I caught all of it, um, but <laughs> hopefully it's, it it's good, helpful, helpful to folks. Um, do you... You obviously used this program um, through your degree work. Um, is that, did you find that you learned it in a class or did you go out and, and teach it to yourself? Um, and if so, how did you do that? I did not have the fortune to have a class that <laughs> was targeted towards any of this. Um, I suppose I could have taken a MATLAB class, but I don't know that it would have helped too much. Fortunately, SOCPROG comes with a manual, so it will explain how each of the functions work. Hal Whitehead also wrote a book um, that yeah. doesn't directly go with the SOCPROG program, but it explains in a lot more detail the concepts behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to be able to input your data and get a result. It's another to actually know what result you're getting and what it means. Um, so that took a while, many months, to really get a handle on it. Um, but I taught myself for the most part. There used to be a Google Plus uh, group or chat, well, I don't know what they call a forum, where you could write your questions and people who were also working in SOCPROG could answer them. But mm. Google Plus has since gone away. So I don't know if they've replaced it with a different forum mm. in a different platform. There's a um, new but, Reddit group or something yeah. on it. <laughs> If anyone finds that they would like to use any of these programs and has questions, I can do my best to answer. Excellent. Um, we are going to shift gears in a question now. Um, Eric asked about uh, calves, and so to I'm going I'm going to answer part of it. Then I'm going to toss it to Kathleen, and then we're actually going to let Nicole speak. <laughs> yes. um, so Eric referenced uh, dolphin viewing guidelines indicating that you shouldn't be in, get in the water if you see calves. Um, so first I want to get at that sort of starting assumption spot. Um, I don't, there are no like universal dolphin viewing guidelines, right? And so even if it's dolphin viewing, then you wouldn't really be getting in the water to begin with. So in the US, um, there's a Marine Mammal Protection Act and you cannot intentionally swim with wild dolphins. Um, so that's one, which leads to, right, it's different all over the world. So it's different by country. Some countries have very strict regulations on what you can and cannot do. Other countries have zero regulations at all. And then a lot of countries are in between. Um, so here in the Bahamas, there is also a Marine Mammal Protection Act here. Um, it is a very inspecific document, um, but uh, we are lucky enough to work with an ecotour operator here in Bimini who has developed a code of conduct with another operator. So <gasps> competitors working together and getting along. Um, and so they've created dolphin swim guidelines for here on Bimini that they both voluntarily agree to and stick to. Um, I was lucky enough to kind of help them out with that a little bit to make sure that their guidelines were biologically relevant. Um, mm -hmm. It's, a, you know, you wouldn't choose the same thing for a shark or a dolphin or, you know, a, I don't know, a squid. Um, so you can find that, um, on either of their websites, I'm happy to email it to folks who might be interested. So we do not have a restriction on entering the water just because there are calves there. 
um, we are always being as respectful as possible and as non-invasive as possible. So we do not feed the dolphins. We do not touch the dolphins. We don't chase them. Um, we try our best to sort of interpret their behavior. If they're swimming away, we get out of the water and we watch them from the boat. Um, if it is a very young calf, if a mother seems like she wants her calf away, then, then we adjust our behavior accordingly. Um, so that is how we handle observing um, mothers and calves here in Bimini. We have a lot of mother and calves here in Bimini. So it's a very common uh, group type to see and observe. Kathleen. And also we are permitted by the um, Department of Marine Resources under the Agriculture Department, I think division in the Bahamas. So uh, we, we actually uh, have had our permits since we've been doing data collection and research in the Bahamas. And, and so we identify our protocol and how we're gonna collect our data, our non-invasive protocol. And so we are permitted and we also provide reports. So even though the countries are different in what they do, there's varying permitting restrictions and requirements and we follow those for the Bahamian government. We also, as Cal was identifying the code of conduct for the two operators in Bimini, we also have a code of conduct on the DCP website that we have been following and it outlines all of the details that she had mentioned for interacting, not really interacting with, but observing the dolphins and collecting the data. Uh, we probably would prefer, I know I would prefer if the dolphins ignored us, it doesn't always happen, but we do the best we can. And in, as Cal said, if we see anything going on that suggests we shouldn't be in the water, we get out and we pull people out of the water as well. Uh, and with that, I was hoping that maybe Cal could, uh, not Cal, sorry, Nicole might talk about um, the different age groups and um, whether you included mothers and calves in your social network analysis or if you focused on just other groups. Um, yeah, so in my association network, I did not include individuals when they were a calf because that would um, their associations might be skewed based on their mother's associations so we don't know if calves are hanging out with particular other individuals because they choose to or because their mothers are doing so and because I based my restrictions about who was going to be included in both networks starting with the association network that has also um, I did not include individuals when they were calves in the interaction network either um, but that is a very good question. Otherwise, I did include all groups and I did include mothers when they had calves, just not their calves at that time. Um, I did want to, I read that question and I had a little bit of a tangent that was very interesting. Um, we also have to keep in mind our limitations. So we don't include dolphins in our association studies unless we have confirmed evidence, either video or photo evidence that we can look at later. So some of our dolphins are identifiable from the boat or simply when we're swimming with them, we can know that who they are. But if we don't have something that we can refer to later, we don't include them because we might be skewing our mm -hmm. data towards dolphins that are more easily identified, um, whether they have scarring or, you know, an intern or one of us is particularly comfortable identifying spots of a certain dolphin, we want to make sure that we um, are eliminating that bias. We also are limited by our video of our focal dolphins. So while we try mm -hmm. to collect as much data on as many different dolphins and who they interact with as possible, and we r remove our own bias by selecting random dolphins, we still are obviously only looking at these dolphins in front of us and what we're recording of them the dolphins behind us might be interacting. Um, so everything has its own limitations when we're studying behavior and wild species, especially. And certainly this type of science, it can never be perfect. You can never have everything. And so we just account for those limitations and confounding variables and proceed with our questions as best we can. Because if we waited for the data to be perfect, we'd never do anything. And we do account for some of that, um, the limitations in our statistics. Yeah. So we use tests that are going to correct a little bit for 
some of those biases and limitations. Mm -hmm. um, the interactions that you spoke of, you showed a video with that example of pectoral fin contact. Um, what other behaviors um, did you see or did you classify as interaction? And did they include things like aggression and courtship? Um, we don't actually see a lot of aggression among the bimini dolphins, at least not when we're in the water recording. So obviously it could be happening when we're not around. Um, but other behaviors that we see include uh, soci sociosexual behaviors like uh, rostrums towards the genitals or their heads pushing on the genitals or even um, going belly up under each other. Um, we wouldn't necessarily call it courtship but we also see play behaviors. We see dolphins chasing each other around. Um, what I specifically was logging were physical contacts. So when two body parts made contact and then from those, I just picked the ones that included a pectoral fin. We are looking at, at DCP in general and Nicole is part of this. We are looking at other examples of contact behavior as well as how dolphins will swim next to one another in, in pair positions and object play. So we are looking uh, in more detail at the quality of the relationship between every pair of individuals in the group. It's just that that requires a lot more analysis. And so check back with us in a few months and we, we might have some previews on that. Yes, um, I think we have time for one or two more questions, mm -hmm. if that's okay, Nicole. Um, Allo is, is in the chat um, and he's a longtime DCP uh, follower. And so he is referencing uh, the White Sand Ridge dolphins. So for those of you who are new, uh, there's a group of dolphins around Bimini who we born, raised, live out their entirety of their lives as far as we knew in this area. And then dolphins from the Northern Bahamas came to Bimini. And at the time, we didn't know if that was just like a quick little vacation, uh, but a lot of them stayed. Um, so Aloe's question is, did the arrival of these um, other dolphins cause you issues with your overall analysis or conclusions? Um, that was actually one of the chapters of my dissertation. And I did expect to find more shifts in behavior that we would be able to notice, but we really didn't see too much difference. Um, the associations shifted a little bit, but we didn't really see a difference in the interactions. The White Sand Ridge dolphins tended to stay to themselves and didn't interact so much with the Bimini dolphins. Bimini dolphins had no problem continuing to interact the way that they had always done in the presence of White Sand Ridge dolphins. Um, so hopefully that'll be a talk that I can give soon, um, and it'll also be a publication in the coming months, but a very good question. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think we're very fortunate that we didn't see too many changes actually. Yes, I was quite concerned about it because um, even though they're the same species and in relatively the same geographies, they really do have some differences in their behaviors when they were in their, their home ranges. Um, so all very interesting and exciting stuff. Um, with that, a uh, quick follow-up, the years that you included for this social network analysis was all post-arrival of White Sand Ridge, correct? Yes. So, and that was, was that intentional, a way to control for that um, change, or was that just like the number of years you had time to do? Um, it was a little bit of both, and I did want to include the White Sand Ridge dolphins if I could, but they didn't interact as much with, well, we just didn't record as many interactions of them. So I wasn't able to include as many of them in this analysis as I would have liked to. Um, but that was just a really solid chunk of years with good data. <laughs> that was pretty and, much why I selected. And plenty. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've referenced your dissertation versus your um, publications, and I gave folks the link if they want to read the COA paper that came out last year. Um, I don't know that you can save it. I think it's like a read-only access, but it's free, so anybody who scroll up in the chat, you can find that link. Um, is your dissertation kind of private? Do folks need to wait for your publications? Um, no, if you would like to look at my dissertation, you are welcome to. 
I think you could find it through the UMass Dartmouth website, but I don't. Can you we could link also to it on email our DCP email and ask yeah. for it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I will say it is 200 Lengthy. and some odd pages, so <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to look at it. <laughs> Excellent. And Kathleen, did you have one more question? I well, lost track if we got to all of them. Oh, I, I have lots of questions, but <laughs> I don't need many of them. I just, I think I wanted to point out or sort of chat with Nicole. When you were talking about um, the theoretical removal of individuals to assess what, what might happen, what might go on, um, there, in, in my view, I think that's a good way to identify what might happen to a group if there, you know, if something, if you're trying to predict, you know, if a hurricane comes and animals dies, or you know, if there's a biotoxin or something like that. Um, but when you're doing it as a modeling, it, I, and and I would ask you this because I've not really done modeling. There are confounds that you might not be able to take into effect. So if if you pull out an individual. Or if for some reason, and this, and the reason I say this is, it's been observed in a few cases in other locations where they have these really neat social networks based on coefficients of association set up, and then an animal dies or isn't seen again, and they see a complete restructuring of the group. And I wonder if there's any way to control for what the model will tell you based on the data that you've collected, and then how you can address potential confounds like personalities, in terms of if if you know an important individual dies you would expect it to be this you know to, to rework itself a certain way but if if one of the remaining dolphins really doesn't like the other dolphin it may not pan out that way and and i don't know if if that's and being very anthropomorphic in saying that but is there a way to a, to control for that when you're trying to assess you know a a model um Does that makes sense <laughs> yes know. and I did not do this, but there would be ways of adding to of quantifying those factors okay. and adding them in. So you could probably do if you knew that individual two didn't get along with four, you could put some kind of variable that what represented like um, repulsion. So you could have some degree of where dolphins would be repelled and are unlikely to associate. So if there were an intermediary and you took that one out, these dolphins will never interact because they don't like each other. You could account for it. Um, okay. But you would just have to make it a numerical thing that is measurable. Um, so that made me think of, for example, number 22, split jaw, who seems to hold a very important role in both the association and interaction network. When we take him out, uh, in a simulated removal, mm -hmm. it doesn't really seem like it has a huge impact on everybody else. Obviously there are fewer connections, but he also seems to play a role in some sort of mentoring as we are mm -hmm. starting to investigate. Um, so it's likely that his, his removal would have a higher impact than the removal of, yeah. I don't know, a female with similar betweenness who doesn't have such a role um, in mentoring. Yeah. And I hope it is a lot of years before we can see what happens when split jaw is not there. So I'm just I would be putting happy that to out talk there. about this theoretically <laughs> forever. He can yeah. live forever. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you. Yes. And thank you everyone for um, joining our first webinar of 2021. Uh, Nicole, we were Yay. honored to have it led by you and we look forward to um, more uh, information from you as the year goes on. And thank you to everyone who listened live, who asked a question, who's listening to a recording. Um, we hope that you enjoyed it all and uh, we'll see